Thank you, thank you. Uh, it's nice to see you all this evening. Um, I'm going to introduce our speaker after you dine, but I do want to remind you all why we're here. Um, uh, I think you all know who I am. I'm Barry Posen. I direct the Security Studies Program. Uh, you know, I went to the change of command ceremony for the Chief of Naval Operations recently, and they, they get to say the 29th Chief of Naval Operations, the 30th Chief of Naval Operations. So I get to say I'm the third director of the Security <laughs> Studies Program at MIT. Right. Um, <laughs> We, we can only hope that there are 10 or 20 more until all security problems are solved, and then we can turn this into the security study program and everyone can get into stocks and bonds or something. Um, well, it's risky, um, maybe riskier than our business, who knows. Uh, so uh, we're fortunate tonight uh, to be here, um, brought together by the first director, Jack Rowena, um, and uh, uh, we named the dinner after him, and Jack uh, actually endowed um, this activity. And this is a case of sort of balancing behavior, because as you remember, the second director, Harvey Sapolsky, he started the Doolittle Dinner Series, which has a quite martial flavor to it. And since Jack was more in the arms control tradition, not entirely, because we know that he worked on advanced military technology, but he thought of it that way and said, there's got to be some balance here. He says, I want you to have something to remember me by that talks about um, what was a matter that was dear to his heart, which was a nuclear arms control. So this is the third Rowena Nuclear Age dinner in our series. Um, and um, I just want to say a word about Jack. Jack is Professor Emeritus of Electrical Engineering here at MIT. He can't be with us this evening. Um, he's an old time uh, scientist and intellectual. He was an undergraduate at the City College of New York, which um, in its day and probably still is a place that collected a lot of really high powered talent. Uh, and uh, brought it into the world of, of academia and science and, and business. He did his graduate work at the Polytechnic Institute of Brooklyn. He earned master's and doctorates there. He has been granted an outstanding alumnus award from both of those colleges. He taught at Brown and the University of Illinois, uh, where he headed the radar division of the Control System Laboratory. Um, he served in several senior positions at the DOD, the last being the director of, of DARPA and was honored with the Fleming Award for being one of the 10 outstanding young men in government in 1962, when Jack was a young man. Um, he served on many government committees, including a presidential appointment by the General Advisory Committee, and was act acted as a senior consultant to the White House Office of Science and Technology. He also held the post of president of the Institute for Defense Analysis, where some of our alumni often find work. At MIT, he was vice president for special laboratories, and he was secretary of the MIT faculties. He had a very, very distinguished career. Um, uh, he was really the founder of this operation here, and we still benefit from many of the things he did and many of the things he's organized, and we're just very, very pleased that he's been able to make this possible and so that we have a, an, annual, an annual event where we can, we can talk about this very, very important issue that isn't going to go away. It's going to have the same half-life as uh, nuclear materials. Um, so I hope you enjoy your dinners, and afterwards I'll introduce our speaker this evening, Thomas Pickering, um, and uh, we'll move on with uh, the program. So thanks for being here. Um, you know, just like many of you, I, uh, I can't resist the uh, temptation to Google people up, even if I've been handed a bio. And uh, I, I Google up the ambassador, and of course the first thing that pops up is wiki. Um, and uh, I was moved by the last sentence of his wiki biography, which says, he is fluent in French, Spanish, and Swahili languages, and has a working knowledge of Russian, Hebrew, and Arabic. And I, I started thinking how mine would read, and it would said, can make himself utterly misunderstood in French, and has a working knowledge of English. <laughs> It's a real privilege to have with us Thomas Pickering this evening. Um, Ambassador Pickering is currently Vice Chairman of Hills and Company, which provides advice and counsel to a number of U.S. enterprises. He recently retired as Senior Vice President for International Relations and a member of the Executive Council of Boeing, which he's been with for, he was with for many years, uh, five. Um, and he was responsible for Boeing's relations with foreign governments and the company's globalization. Um, since he retired, he's been involved in many um, public policy kinds of causes, and the one I know him best on um, is matters having to do with Iran and the Iranian 
nuclear program, which for this purposes we'll call either a nuclear energy program or a weapons program, depending on your own religious persuasion, but it's, it's one or the other, maybe both. Um, and he was uh, kind enough to chair a panel some years ago on a paper that I wrote as part of a Century Foundation project on what to do about Iran. And um, I had the, um, the unhappy duty of talking about what to do if Iran actually did get nuclear weapons. And the ambassador was quick to point out that that's what we were trying to avoid here. <laughs> we should move on to the, to the discussions about how we were going to avoid this and not tarry too long in the grim world of what we would do if it happened. Um, he joined Boeing in 2001 after he retired as U.S. Undersecretary of State for Political Affairs. Um, prior to that, he was briefly president of the Eurasia Foundation. Um, I keep calling him an ambassador because he has the personal rank of career ambassador, which is the highest in the U.S. Foreign Service. Uh, he was in the Foreign Service for almost five decades. At various points, he was ambassador to the Russian Federation, India, Israel, El Salvador, Nigeria, and the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan. He also had assignments in Zanzibar and Dar es Salaam. Uh, He's worked in um, the United Nations. Uh, he worked in uh, um, he worked as uh, uh, in the Department of State as special assistant to the secretaries William Rogers and Henry Kissinger. Um, he's a former naval officer um, and also in the Naval Reserve. He served in the Bureau of Intelligence and Research in State. Uh, worked in the Arms Control and Disarmament Agency, the now lamented and lost Arms Control and Disarmament Agency, um, and at the U.S. delegation to the Disarmament Conference of the United Nations. Um, he has a bachelor's degree from Bowdoin College, which recently gave him a honorary doctorate, and he has many other honorary doctorates as well. Um, in 1983 and 1986, he won the Distinguished Presidential Award, and in 1996, the Department of State's highest award, the Distinguished Service Award. And he's a member of all the usual suspects, the ISS and the Council on Foreign Relations. And we're really pleased he could be with us this evening to talk about the problem of managing proliferation in the world and some ideas. And he's asked me if he may speak, um, uh, I guess talk show style, from the center, the center of the room, which he will try and do without a microphone. And uh, if there's a problem hearing him, then we'll kind of relocate to the, uh, to the front here of the podium. So I'm going to turn the ceremonies over to the ambassador, and he will lead us. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, it's great to see you all. And I wanted to try, in the spirit of Jacqueline and of your work and your interest, to look at the question principally of nuclear developments in the civil sector, principally power, and the impact influence of nonproliferation concerns, and at the end perhaps present you with some thoughts and ideas about how we might both improve our capacity to deal with Iran, where I've spent a lot of time, as Barry told you, uh, and maybe uh, by inclusion, the DPRK, and to talk a little bit about how some of those ideas might be migrated into the broader nonproliferation world, uh, together with some other thoughts of finding ways that we might deal with uh, the loopholes in the NPT on sensitive technology, and some of the issues that come out of countries using the NPT or misusing the NPT to develop nuclear capacity, which is then moved into the, into the military sphere, into the weapons sphere. All the things that, that I think you know well and have been engaged in. Um, I remain convinced that nuclear has a role to play in, the, in, in world generation of electrical energy. Uh, it is, like everything else, not an unalloyed, uh, totally simply splendid general good without any problems, uh, like coal, like fossil fuels, like wind, uh, like everything else solar that we can think of. Uh, there are problems and drawbacks as well as advantages. Uh, none of them, in my view, are necessarily showstoppers. But over the years, the nuclear, in part uh, because of its atomic uh, connotation, has had the tendency, at least in many groups, to produce uh, show-stopping frights uh, through mistakes, accidents, indirection, and all the rest. And we can't obviously ignore those. So not our, those are not things that are going to be easily waved away. Um, I can see a gradual growth in nuclear over time, but I don't see, particularly in this country, 
a new effort to build a, 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 a plant a day in every state kind of thing. That will take a lot of time and a lot of effort. Uh, we will also, I think, want continually to look at the regulatory atmosphere. If we uh, look at uh, nuclear on the kind of economic side, there is certainly a very high cost of entry and perhaps a much more reasonable cost for operating in financial terms, and I think that will stay for a long time, although I'm not an expert in technology and will try to shy away uh, from feeding you technological tidbits, uh, but I want to talk more about the international environment and the observations from the point of view of a, diploma, of a diplomat. There's no question at all any of us who fools with this area uh, does so at their peril without understanding at least the basic rudiments of the technology and hopefully you will not find me totally wanting in that in that cause but your corrections and obviously criticisms are welcome at any time. Um, I think that uh, one analyzes the drawbacks of the nuclear power equation one is immediately led to questions of safety and security and questions of proliferation in addition to some of the other issues that come up. And those, in my view, remain the principal serious problems that must be dealt with as we move ahead. Uh, there are many ways to deal with those, not all of them, in my view, yet fully invented. For those of you of a technological bent, I think we continue to cry out for new technological capacities in this area as well. Uh, people are looking at small modular reactors as perhaps a new way to proceed, and that seems to me to have some interest and some advantage. We look at safety and security uh, principally as a reactor operation concern, and to some extent, at the back end of the nuclear reactor, what to do with the spent fuel. I'd like to spend, therefore, a few minutes on spent fuel and some of the thoughts and ideas that we might want to consider with respect to spent fuel, and then move on to the forward end of the fuel cycle, the enrichment problem. Each of these, as you well know, better than I do, involves sensitive technologies, either reprocessing for separation of plutonium or uh, enrichment uh, for the concentration uh, in a future reactor fuel of fissionable material for use in reactors. Uh, in one sense, I think it's a truism that at the back end, spent fuel contains plutonium and a single cycle reprocessing action tends to produce an outcome which can quickly be moved into weapons. Uh, people have expressed, put it this way, um, doubts that reactor fuel plutonium is sufficient for an explosion, but the United States years ago tried it and it unfortunately works. And so we do know, in fact, that while it might not be optimized or ideal, it is there. Uh, the sensitive enrichment cycle, particularly with centrifuges, produces gradations of enrichment and it takes time and effort. Obviously, the first stage is being the most demanding uh, and the most difficult in terms of time and effort and higher stages of enrichment approve uh, probably on a geometric or a logarithmic scale in terms of lack of difficulty. And so uh, enrichment levels above 20% begin to make everybody extremely nervous. Uh, it is also true that once you have a knowledge of enrichment with reasonable adeptness technology uh, can take a cascade and allow you to move up to higher levels of enrichment with the fundamental ideas of a cascade and the fundamental information you have. So there is no technical barrier at the various stages that in any sense I think is insuperable. Having said all of that, let me now go back uh, to the spent fuel. Uh, we do know how, within reason, Fukushima indicated that you could make mistakes in storage of spent fuel, uh, but within reason we know how we can store spent fuel for fairly long periods of time. Initial storage in reactor pools for a cool down period and then longer term potentially dry storage 
in large metal containers uh, that provide uh, safety and security against radiation. Uh, and uh, they also provide uh, a very stable base for storage, provided you pick the right sort of conditions geologically and with respect to weather events like uh, tsunamis. Uh, all of that means that uh, we have been struggling over what to do about the back end of the fuel cycle. And there are those who raise questions about long-term storage of spent fuel, partly because it doesn't ask, answer the ultimate question, uh, which at one point in the United States was how can we guarantee that it'll not be a problem for the next 500,000 years. The other question was how can we guarantee uh, that it will not be a problem in proliferation terms uh, given the presence of plutonium uh, inside the spent reactor fuel. Uh, my feeling at the moment is that uh, we are seeing intensive crowding of reactor pools at civilian reactors, and there may well be uh, an economic as well as perhaps a safety and security opportunity uh, to devise places where you can store uh, fuel in dry facilities uh, for a significant period of time, 20, 30, 40, 50 years, uh, without having solved all the ultimate problems. But ne never, nevertheless, necessarily, removing fuel from crowded reactor pools and moving it into a place where you can provide the security for the facility uh, and the safety uh, without running very high risks. There is a NIMBY problem, obviously, uh, as there was with Yucca Flats. But one hopes and believes that you don't have to store it all in one place. Uh, there are also, I think, pretty good responses in terms of safe transportation, uh, which are the other sets of issues that people have with respect to spent fuel and its movement. Uh, will we have a railroad accident or will we have a ship sink? All of which are possible, but so far, I think reasonable satisfaction that those problems uh, can be satisfactorily dealt with uh, and therefore are not showstoppers. Many believe, in fact, that once you begin with longer term storage, 40, 50 year storage of spent fuel above ground, you will want again, once again, examine the question of whether, in fact, it might go below ground in dry, safe conditions for longer periods of time, given the obvious additional security that underground storage might provide uh, with respect to spent fuel, particularly significant quantities of spent fuel. The other side of the equation, as you well know, is that, in fact, separation of the plutonium uh, in the eyes of some provides additional advantages. It allows you to take plutonium out of the spent fuel and in various forms, including mixed oxides, uh, burn it up in reactors in the future. Probably not burn it all up, but burn up a significant quantity, but still leaves very nasty residues that will have to be dealt with as a disposal problem, uh, not necessarily an explosive problem. The other piece that I'm most concerned about is if we proliferate uh, reprocessing technology, which has not served uh, all of the developers equally well, the Japanese have had considerable and notable long-term pro policy problems with it, uh, we in fact put at the disposal or encourage or at least do not discourage the adoption of the technology more widely, which as I said very earlier in my talk, produces uh, an end product which uh, with very little extra work can go in nuclear weapons. It isn't dumbed down, it isn't civil grade, it's industrial strength uh, nuclear explosive material. Uh, and that obviously raises very serious questions for us all. And as we know, a number of countries have arrived at their weapons programs uh, through the use of uh, optimized production reactors and reprocessing as a way to proceed. So my own view is that long-term storage uh, coupled with the earliest possible cessation of reprocessing as a general matter uh, makes a lot of sense. Uh, it would make a lot of sense in my view for the nuclear five countries to take the lead with the exception of the fact that both France and Russia have large numbers of people who are married to the fact that the use of plutonium and fuel is a simply splendid alternative to long-term storage. My view there would be that the best approach to this would be to take the economic argument. 
unless and until the much higher cost plutonium mixed oxide fuel, all costs included, can compete with low enriched uranium for reactor, for fueling reactors, we should stay away. Long term dry storage, in effect, permits you to keep the option open without having to adopt it early and to adopt at least an economic standard that will give you reasonable protection for the foreseeable future, in my view, uh, because despite uh, the, the talk of some that we are running out of uranium, it does not, in my view, seem anywhere near uh, likely or possible uh, that plutonium mixed oxide fuel, because of scarcity of uranium, or indeed maybe higher costs for producing low enriched fuel, will be anywhere near competition. So in effect, it's a slam dunk for as long as anybody in this room will live and probably your grandchildren and great-grandchildren as far as I can see. And it makes sense to do that. Uh, that would begin to create, uh, I hope, a very serious closing of the reprocessing loophole. If the five permanent members were prepared of the Security Council, the five recognized nuclear states of the NPT, were prepared to take a self-denying ordinance on reprocessing. Uh, it would go a long way. Even if three were, I would think it would make a great deal of sense. And it would, as another step I'll talk about shortly, it would reinforce, in effect, the moratorium that we all have, the five nuclear powers, on the production of any fissile material for use in weapons programs. And it would be extremely helpful as a result to have an inspected uh, program of no reprocessing. Uh, and that would, in my view, begin to be a backdoor way of moving toward the FMCT, or certainly of putting belts and braces, if I could put it around this, on the voluntary moratorium that's now in place not to do it, but with no inspection. So I think that makes a certain amount of sense. Now, turning to Iran, and to some extent the DPRK, where our concern has been both with respect to reprocessing and now enrichment, uh, much more broad. Our concern in Iran has been for many years uh, with Iran's developing program of enrichment and the fact that this provides a route for Iran uh, to a weapons development program. And there are numbers of indications on the horizon uh, that lead one to believe that it is pretty hard conclusively to dismiss the fact that the Iranians have a serious interest in having technology and the capacity uh, to make weapons, even if, in fact, uh, they are going to approach a weapon on the basis that, yes, we could do it, but we are not going to do it right away. I can remember arguments 25 years ago about the Pakistan program, and exactly the same sets of arguments were made then. So the ability to resist the siren call, once you get the capacity, is maybe something beyond what the Iranians themselves can sustain I don't know. There are a lot of things we don't know about Iran, and I think that's one of the things. But we have to operate on the, on the assumption, and I certainly do, that there is a serious Iranian interest, despite all their denials, in a nuclear weapons program. We have to treat it as such. I think turning to Iran and Iranian enrichment, uh, I remain and continue to be concerned by the fact that Iran continues to plow ahead with enrichment. Uh, we continue to have a limited ability in Iran, since it at one point accepted the additional protocol, has never ratified it, and as a result of our recent differences, differences over the last two years, in fact, is not now permitting inspections under the additional protocol. The additional protocol, as you all know, provides additional access and additional ways of proceeding. It's not the perfect answer to all inspection needs, but it is a good leap forward in an important way of, I think, beginning uh, to find a way to tighten up, if I could put it this way, uh, the enrichment loophole as well as other facets uh, of a potential uh, nuclear weapons program under the guise of the treaty. So it, so it is important. Uh, I, for one, and, and, and Jim Walsh here has joined me and, and other friends have been talking for the last three or four years about an approach to the Iranian nuclear program. We have combined three elements. I'll do this very quickly. Uh, one element is that we should open the door to discussions with Iran on the major issues that are out there between us. 
And in fact, I, for one, think that you ought to have an open-ended agenda, but Iraq and Afghanistan are important questions to both the United States and Iran. We, interestingly enough, have common interests in Iraq and in Afghanistan, as well as differences over them. So it is not an impossible approach. And the Iranians have, from time to time, in the past, made clear that they would like to talk about Iran and Afghanistan. So I think that an approach to this issue cannot be, in my view, successful if it's exclusively nuclear. It can't be successful either if it's exclusively uh, Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, so we've got to open the door to the panel. On the nuclear side, I felt for a long period of time that rolling back the Iranian enrichment program, which is certainly one clear object of the United States and the Western Europeans, or freezing it for an interminate, indeterminate basis or not all, that we are not in a position to be able to achieve that. That it is, however, important that we do everything we can uh, to put that program uh, in the context of civilian needs and civilian uses, reactor fuel, LEU, uh, and not let it go beyond there, uh, which is something the Iranians have also, as you know, uh, begun to deal with because uh, they have been unable to obtain international support uh, for a reactor the United States provided them in Tehran that now is used to manufacture medical isotopes and requires refueling with 20% enriched material which they have undertaken to produce themselves, even though they have no known capacity to produce the fuel elements. Argentina and France have that capacity. It's a technological issue, which I don't think, despite their confidence, they're able to solve on their own. They recently opened the door to us and said, we'll stop enriching at 20% if you'll provide the fuel elements for our reactor. And in my view, that's an opening that's worth taking and using as a way to see if you can broaden the conversation. And indeed, since they have gone from 5% to 20%, they say in their cascades, why not take the material they've already manufactured at 20% and include it in the program, uh, since the fuel rods are for them? And why not also seek to get an overall 5% enrichment cap in Iran, uh, since in fact they have no demonstrated need for anything higher uh, as a way of dealing in the first stage with this problem? It doesn't take away all the low and rich uranium, uh, which we're concerned about because 1,200 kilos of that is the basis for uh, a weapon fully enriched uh, to above 85%. Uh, but it's a start in that direction. They now have about 4,000 kilograms of low and rich uranium. Uh, we uh, see them continuing to move ahead. Uh, we see their centrifuge program set back by sabotage, but not in any way uh, completely stopped by it. Uh, I think that were we to move in this direction, the appropriate quid pro quo for the United States would be to get as good an inspection system as the IAEA can design. Certainly standard safeguards inspections, which are in place now. The additional <coughs> protocol, in my own view, would be there would be some things that would make some sense, maybe coming out of lessons of inspection in Iraq with uncommon unmobile that could be added uh, to the inspection process. And maybe you could even get an agreement with the Iranians eventually that new inspection technologies could be introduced as a way of continuing to assure the process goes. The Iranians have not shown inordinate sensitivity, unlike the Soviets in the early days of disarmament, to inspections. It's quite interesting. Uh, maybe they will in a negotiation, but we haven't seen it yet. Um, but this approach uh, then raised the question in my mind and in the minds of others, if this makes sense as a way of dealing with the problem of enrichment in Iran, why not pluralize it? Why not use this approach to see, in fact, whether uh, we can set an international standard? That does two things. One, it helps us with Brazil and Argentina or Australia or anybody else that wants to launch an inspection. Very broad inspection. Uh, for permitted enrichment. And why not also look at multilateralizing the enrichment facility, not the technology, but the operational details, the business case of how much you're making at what level and where it's going to increase transparency. This kind of paradigm, I think, would be helpful. Uh, it doesn't mean that everybody would go for it, but it means that everybody who wants to go for it would not be subject to what is essentially a vicarious American policy 
where we told Brazil it's okay for you because we trust you, but we don't trust Iran, and so we have a colossal double standard. But if we were to undertake uh, the adoption of the same problem for ourselves and the other five nuclear powers, where I think there is more opportunity too, one, we would once again reinforce the moratorium on not making fissile material uh, for use in weapons by the five nuclear powers. It would give an inspection system to back it up that would make some sense, and so we would do another piece of what I would call the backdoor FMCT. Uh, we're certainly not going to get India, Israel, or Pakistan on this right away, uh, but we might over a period of years be able also uh, to move them in that direction. And there are other steps that we could take that I'll talk about later on. Uh, that I think would help in that regard. But I think also it would begin to set an international long-term standard uh, for enrichment activities, uh, particularly important if, in fact, um, what I would call uh, garage laser enrichment becomes imp important or possible. There are people writing about this. I don't think we're there. Uh, but if anybody can have a laser enrichment facility in their garage, you certainly want to have the maximum amount of inspection capacity and as much of a deterrent as you can over a period of time. And that's obviously a hyperbolic piece, but it gives you an indication that we ought to be worried about modern improvements in enrichment capacity, which reduce the footprint and make it harder to find, and as a result, more difficult for us to deal with it, putting in place a system which would give you that capacity would be, I think, very helpful now as a general proposition. Finally, the fact that the five nuclear powers did it would, in my view, set the international standard for the future, and that would be helpful. And while it doesn't entirely close all of the loopholes, it does the best that we can conceivably do now uh, to put restrictions around uh, enrichment uh, so it, in fact, meets civil needs uh, and does everything it possibly can to deter or detect diversion uh, or clandestine replication or whatever you want to call it uh, in a country that engages itself in. So there would be a standard that if you enter into enrichment under these circumstances, you accept the widest possible inspection, the additional protocol, and so on. With respect to Iran and maybe with other countries that will be producing large amounts of LEU uh, for nuclear reactors, where there are no visible reactors in sight, which is one of the problems with the Iranian program, it might be also useful to think about fuel fabrication. That is, to take the LEU in gaseous form, uh, which is very much ready for upgrading, and take it out of the tanks and transform it uh, into fuel, fuel elements for the kind of reactors the country is going to have. This builds into the fuel itself a resistance, if I could put it this way, not an absolute barrier, but a resistance <coughs> to moving rapidly to breakout uh, by upgrading uh, LEU uh, in readily enrichable form, if I could put it that way. And I think that makes a certain amount of sense. It would be useful for us to follow. Uh, beyond that, there's been a lot of discussion of a fuel tank. Uh, I, much more discussion than there has been activity. But my feeling has always been that a fuel bank ought to be available uh, as a make weight against independent local enrichment. And it ought to be something that would be available uh, as the supplier of last resort to any country having a palpable need that was complying with the non proliferation obligations, the IAEA which has that responsibility to assure us about would therefore be a key player in the process. One way of doing this might be to take uh, the five nuclear powers and begin to make contributions of enriched material uh, to a fuel bank. Uh, one thought is, of course, that it might be stored. People have continued to think of Switzerland as a place that would not be subject to the kind of limitations that might be imposed on a process if a country didn't particularly like country X and wanted to use leverage against country X for any other purpose in denying it nuclear fuel. Uh, you'd have to look at that, but that may well be a significant and useful way to proceed. I think that no country that accepts fuel, the fuel bank would be 
uh, immune from the regular IAEA safeguards process. And one might even think that with further countries joining the additional protocol, that could become the standard for moving the question ahead. There are other things that I think we should look at and perhaps do uh, and take on. One of those would be uh, to use the capacity of the United Nations Security Council to speak on behalf of the world community and in a backhanded way to legislate if it's careful. There are many who have objected to the idea that the UN Security Council could begin legislating in areas where there is no threat to peace and security or where the legislation is peripheral uh, to dealing uh, with an exigent event which threatens international peace and security. But it has already done that in some cases in terrorism. So they're a little bit pregnant in that direction. Uh, but I think it would be helpful uh, to have the Security Council reinforce uh, some of these approaches if they are adopted. Uh, and the Security Council could do that, I think, certainly under the fact that the heads of state of the international community in 1991 uh, declared uni universally, all members of the Security Council heads of state declared that uh, nonproliferation was a major threat to international peace and security, and it's been indelibly on the Security Council agenda ever since then uh, as a major question. So there's no question of the fact that the standard standing of this issue in a broad sense uh, could be pulled forward and dealt with, and the Security Council could be helpful in reinforcing some of this loophole closing and setting of standards that we've talked about. The other question, and I'll, I'll end shortly, that I'm concerned about, I think lots of people are concerned about, and the Security Council might be helpful here, is the fact that states have used uh, international assistance given them in the nuclear area as members of the NPT uh, to develop programs and activities which in effect are designed to achieve objectives entirely contrary to the NPT's objective of no nuclear weapons. DPRK, I think, is a perfect example. The DPRK has gone through the cycle and opted out of the NPT. I think that there is no chance that you could get the parties to the NPT uh, quickly to agree among themselves. There are 100 and what? 88 or something like that. Uh, that they will take steps to block countries getting out of the NPT and still enjoying the benefits of everything that they got into the NPT. I think there are not many good ways to do that. Uh, one of them might be for having the Security Council put in place what I would call triggerable sanctions for countries that do this and fail to accept a continued responsibility. One continuing responsibility, even if you're out of the NPT, which could at least safeguard the international community in some way that you were not using the NPT to make nuclear weapons would be a continued inspection regime. Uh, you can't take back, I guess, everything that's been provided. But over a period of time, making countries ship back fuel might be another way to proceed. Uh, the Security Council could be enormously helpful in setting that standard, uh, particularly if you had a large sentiment in the international community to make it happen. The Security Council has the authority uh, to pass mandatory rules. But if they're ignored, <laughs> if the Security Council loses its authority, and the international community finds that it's in deeper trouble than when it started. But if you could convince large numbers of states to support and move in that direction, it would have a useful opportunity. So Security Council is not an open-ended opportunity uh, to legislate, and of course, with the Security Council, you'll have to convince particularly the Russians and the Chinese uh, not to block any such action as you go ahead. There might be ways to do that. It's not, in my view, an entirely foregone conclusion that you won't get it, but it needs to be looked at. Well, these are all ways to strengthen a regime which is faltering, which has had serious problems in terms of its ability to manage uh, what it is doing in Korea and in Iran. Uh, they're important, I think, for us to move ahead. There are ways, in my view, to move without going to war, and this is the first mention of that, but if you want to discuss that in, in question and answer, I'm delighted to do it. I've spent a lot of my time uh, in self-torture over that set of issues. Uh, and I think that it's important for us to consider that, uh, but my own view is that there are a few people outside 
of the Looney bin who are really convinced that military attack has a real sustained value to it in cases of either the DPRK or Iran and maybe on other cases. The only time we went to war uh, to, in fact, try to destroy a nuclear weapons program that wasn't fair, as you know, and that hasn't helped our credibility in trying to deal with this problem in military terms. I think finally, uh, we don't seem uh, in this day and age to have been able to build the coalitions and indeed the organizational activity that's required to support these kinds of actions. I think we need to pay more time, spend more time and pay attention. Uh, unfortunately, I think the only thing that probably would galvanize the international community would be a kind of nuclear 9-11. And I certainly don't counsel that uh, as a, a necessary stimulant to moving questions ahead. Uh, but we sure don't have it now and I'm disturbed by it. It's great to see you. Thank you for hearing me. I'm open to your questions now. The debate seems to be different specifically among different members of the P5 and that how much does the proliferation of these proliferation is unacceptable? It depends. And there are several factors. Um, my own view has been that Russia has continued to pretend up to whom, at least, the discovery of Bardock that we were exaggerating, that what we had to say didn't borne out by the facts as they understood it, and that Iran wasn't the danger that we believed it to be. I think that they revised a little bit that view and have had a tendency to be slightly more supportive. Uh, the Russians and the Chinese have great skepticism about sanctions. In a sense, they uh, were uh, also subject to sanctions during the Cold War. Um, and they say, uh, one, it's not a good thing to do, and secondly, it doesn't achieve very useful objectives. In the, next uh, the third question is a more difficult one, but it's principally a Beijing question. Now, Beijing has had a long-standing policy against authorizing the use of force in the United States, United Nations Security Council. Uh, they don't believe uh, going to war is the answer to international problems. Um, and to some extent, there are plenty of people who may support them in some circumstances. So that's been hard uh, to move the question ahead. Uh, all of those, in some cases, would have to be overcome were you to take one or another lines of argument. So it is not universally necessarily a view that uh, non-proliferation is irrelevant or unnecessary, or as Mao used to say, it's good for everybody to have their own bomb and you know we'll be better off even if we lose 300 billion people, we'll still emerge on top. Uh, so a lot of that craziness is gone. Uh, but there is not <coughs> yet a universal acceptance of a formula uh, to deal with the question. Uh, and in effect, I would say that US policy unites both the right and the left around sanctions, but it doesn't unite the left and the right <coughs> in the United States about if you are successful in pushing sanctions, what do you want them to walk through? Uh, and that remains a difference, and as a result, uh, we don't produce any doors at the moment, <laughs> rather than having two conflicting doors. But that's a more serious problem, in my view. Uh, I don't think that under foreseeable circumstances, you're likely to ratchet the sanctions pressure on Iran up higher. Nor do I think necessarily were you to do so, uh, you would have the kind of influence that we would hope to have to bring them to our preferred formula on what to do about enrichment in Iran. I think, however, if you could, and you have a reasonable chance of bringing them to the kind of formula I suggested, but even if you didn't, you would know very quickly whether, in fact, the formula I suggest, which is sort of give them what they say they want, but do it under the constraints of what they say they don't want to do, uh, and see whether you can get there. Uh, so I think that's sort of where we are. I think we could uh, get more support uh, for sanctions if, in fact, we had a formula to put on the table, uh, which was, uh, put it this way, more likely to be accepted, but at the same time give us reasonable assurances that the program would not be misused for military purposes. I'm going to ask a follow-up to take the prerogative of the chair. Uh, how do you, I mean, this is a, not just a state-to-state state diplomacy problem, but obviously a public relations problem. 
Do you have a view of how you walk back the cat in countries like the United States or France who've been adamant about no enrichment in Iran, no enrichment in Iran, no enrichment in Iran? Because what you're essentially what you're saying is we probably have to tolerate some enrichment in Iran to be able to have a diplomatic package that gets us the chance yeah. of having any control. So do you have any kind of craft knowledge about when and how you kind of get a great power to back off a yeah. table pounding kind of commitment? It's, it's fascinating, Barry, because I would say neither of the table pounders has yet made the case in a conclusive way why no enrichment is so much better than a compromise. So in effect, uh, countries can change their mind. We haven't dug a big hole for ourselves. We're not about to fall into a massive pit full of sharp spears of our own making. And I think that's a help. And in fact, we keep pushing Washington to tell us why they think their approach is so important. And they say, well, concerned about breakout. Uh, and, you know, that's, but are you willing to accept, which I think is inevitable, uh, a very weak inspection system <laughs> for <laughs> a, a, a no enrichment <coughs> deal? as opposed to what I think would be buying stronger inspection uh, by permitting some limited kind of enrichment under conditions that, that I've outlined. But that's my idea, and I, you know, I continue to, to, to think it makes sense trying, but at the moment we haven't persuaded anybody. All right, Cote. Um, I wanted to ask you, sir, about uh, your take on this question about the value of the most aggressive kind of inspection If you look at some of the things that have happened in the last 10 years, you've got to admit, I think, that there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a scenario in which no amount of information obtained through those kinds of means is going to convince a certain segment of our elites, and I'm not going to characterize them in any way, positively or negatively, that they actually know everything they need to know. Because it seems to me that in the run-up to 2003, which you referred to, um, we had, it seems to me, enough information to make it crystal clear that there was not a large Iraqi nuclear program. There wasn't even a small one. You know, there, there may have been bugs and gas on the periphery, but there was no nuclear program, right? But yet, nevertheless, people were talking about mushroom clouds and things like that. Is there, is there any way using inspections to eliminate that uncertainty, that which may not even be sort of you know genuine, it may be just for you exploit it for other political purposes? I, I don't know if I'm asking my question. You know, I, you're, you're doing can right. you can you make absence of evidence, evidence of absence, to use that term, right? Can you? Will it ever work politically? Yeah, I would say two things. One, I think the Iraq War was an aberration. I don't know whether President Bush W. will ever tell us why he really went to war. And maybe he had a, 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 a dynamic and rotating set of reasons. But one assumes even if you have a dynamic and rotating set of explanations for why you're going to war, you must have given some fundamental thought uh, to what it was that you wanted to accomplish by that war. Um, so in that sense, I'm not sure that it is necessarily uh, anything but an aberration and not the standard. But let's assume that, that uh, for the moment, uh, people would act on the basis of information. Uh, I totally agree that we cannot prove the thing on a nuclear weapons program. But I do believe that statistically and mathematically, uh, we can, to a very large degree of basis of experience, narrow that proposition, and that in itself serves as a concern. If, in particular, the consequences were spelled out of breaking the line, which we haven't done yet. So the deterrent depends on two things, having information, but being very clear about what to do with the information uh, in terms of reaction to that program. Um, and I think that uh, I can't tell you that nothing would ever slip through. But I can at the moment tell you I think there is high chance and increasing chances 
of that happen, particularly because we have the capacity to combine many approaches. If we were totally and utterly reliant on IAEA alone, we would have more weaknesses. But we have national information, we have international information, and so on. And we all know we can multiply the factors, and so we can increase, as we have over the years, the uncertainty on the other side about what they could get away with, and we could increase the value of the deterrent proposition uh, were we to be a little more clear about what we would intend in terms of those kinds of things. Uh, it would be even clearer if we were to put in place, say, sanctions which could be triggered. Uh, that is, the Security Council would say, if uh, the Director General of the IAEA uh, finds that there is sufficient information uh, that diversion has taken place or other acts have taken place, uh, which are indicative of a military program, unless the Board of Governors of the IAEA votes it down by a majority, uh, the sanctions are available uh, for countries of the world to adopt, and the expectation would be that they would, would comply with it. So you could put something together uh, under the present day and age which would give you a very strong basis for doing that. Now, a lot would depend on whether you're willing to trust the Director General of the IAEA, or whether you would want to go to a board of governors vote or all the other things, but you could put things together in that sense on whether you get it through or not, I don't know. I think you could have a better chance if you had a more exigent case, uh, and obviously uh, if you had somebody who actually exploded a weapon, I think things would change very rapidly, but I don't want that. Well, but the North Koreans did. Yes, in a, in a test, I agree. So, you know, the second half of your argument is that there's some deterrence that occurs in this scenario that's not somehow available to us now. And I would remind you that, you know, you made the explicit point of talking about people that advocate military options as being in a looking bad Well, I mean, I don't understand how you square that I, circle. I said military options against Iran now. Okay. Um, I think in the end, we're going to have to decide the question. If you want to be decided to negatively for reasons that I think I understand, but don't necessarily think were helpful in the interest of non-proliferation. But I do see a trend. I do. Yeah, no, I, I think all of that's right, and, I, and I, you know, your, your point is well taken. Uh, I think I said we need to decide what we are prepared to do in these cases if people are prepared to break the international rules and use the NPT as a way of developing precisely what the NPT Steve, I wanted to step back from the details of your current problem and sort of be a philosopher or a historian. Jump right out the window here, Steve. Let's step too far. Too far. <laughs> and think about the history of the uh, non proliferation regime and where we are in it, uh, looking all the way back to the beginning, and, and, and talk about um, what has it accomplished um, and what are the trends. And we reached some turning point somewhere in the 90s where it's unraveling. Many people will say, you know, things were looking great for about 10, 15 years up until the mid-90s. And we saw successes, dramatic successes, the denuclearization of Ukraine, Kazakhstan, Belarusia, the you know, stopping of the third billion, Argentina program, South Africa, as you know, and so on. And then uh, since then, we've seen a uh, steady deterioration of the whole regime across the board. Not across the board, but in many places, many ways. We seem to be sort of back on our heels, um, having to accept things today that we didn't think we had to accept in this one saw in Iran. Uh, can you talk about the overall health of the regime? Uh, number one, what has it achieved? Um, I ask that kind of because to me, I don't think that when you think about public discourse in this country, the public doesn't even understand that this regime did achieve anything. I think if you took, All the, the, if you took the, the Kennedy, if you took the Kennedy predictions as the standard. Right. Then we're ahead. If you take South Africa, Taiwan, Republic of Korea, uh, others perhaps who've been pushed off it, then uh, we're not as bad as we might have been. Uh, if you take the scarfing up of the weapons in Kazakhstan and Belarus and bringing them back to the Soviet Union, then that certainly has helped. I think we perhaps have slowed down the progression in the sense you can say, uh, aside from India and Pakistan, uh, and India was a problem beginning in 74 with their test, um, uh, we have had 
the North Korea tests, which I don't particularly like, but I'm happy they were better. Uh, and we have the, uh, the Iranian program, which we have arguments over, but which I think we still have a chance to stop. Uh, so I'm not convinced in the sense that it is all totally unraveling before our eyes on the floor like a, like a, a loose spring from a jumping jack. But I do think that uh, it is time to take another hard look at what we're doing, partly because I think our own policies have tended to be self-defeating. We've let perfection and what I would call other preoccupations <coughs> be the enemy of the good of these things. Uh, and I would like to see that. I think there are a number of other things that we can do over time that I've laid out and maybe more that will help. And I think we need to get rid of exceptionalism. I think that we would have a lot more influence if we could convince the five to take steps which they've already halfway taken uh, and are not likely to cause them immediate and difficult problems, even if in fact we can't bring everybody in the world along with it. Um, my own concerns are that uh, the thresholds for CTBT entrance are such that uh, I think in effect we have created uh, a little bit of a deterrent to success as opposed to the other way around. I mean, I should have said in my prepared talk, but I'd like to see us obviously go and accept the CTB ob CTBT obligations as soon as we possibly can is another way of moving us ahead. And I think if Pakistan is going to block FMCT uh, in Geneva, then we ought to find other ways uh, to work it as much as we can. And I think uh, coalitions of the willing among the P5 might not be a terrible formula for moving things ahead, even if we don't get uh, India, Israel, and Pakistan on board right away. Brian Perry? OK, so I don't want to bore you with I'm going to go in the exact opposite direction from then you bring up real banal with some current event driven questions. And so I've got two of them. And the first is sort of why now uh, in terms of uh, coming back to the negotiating table with the Iranians? Um, you sort of alluded to these recent overtures from Ahmadinejad about um, negotiating something along the lines of something that we'd be interested in, um, especially his recent comments at the UN Graham Allison told us this op-ed in the Washington Post last week about, you know, sort of following up with this. Presumably we are at some level, you know, feeling this out. What, you know, should we take this as evidence that the sanctions have worked? Um, if you were playing the sort of skeptic, are they up to something? Is there sort of some reason that we shouldn't be interested in getting back to this at this point? Is there some reason to be suspicious? That's the sort of the first question. The second question is about this whole business of this, you know, supposed plot to assassinate the Saudi ambassador. And um, Obama, or at least the media, using this as an opportunity to um, reaffirm this sort of, we will take no options off the table in terms of negotiating with the Iranians. And I know you get this question all the time because I've looked at sort of some recent public uh, transcripts of your comments on this, and um, I, so, I, you know, so I know it's something you're comfortable talking about. What do you think is sort of the utility of this position in the United States negotiating position vis-a-vis -vis the Iranians? Uh, quote, unquote, having, you know, taking no options off the table. Are, is, is this something that's actually facilitating our negotiating position? Or, you know, is this actually sort of, you know, facil you know uh, encouraging the sort of threat perception uh, in terms of wanting to have the, the, the nuclear weapons in the first place, you know, precisely because we're making these sorts of threats? So. Well, I think why now? I've been broken record for four years, so don't accuse me of being hyped now. <laughs> I was hyped for four years ago. Uh, my own view is that time isn't on our side. We're really worried about a nuclear program. And we're pursuing a policy which does everything but address the question at hand in the diplomatic uh, environment, which is the only place that I think we can address it successfully. Uh, and if it doesn't work, we should know about it sooner rather than later, uh, because then we don't have to decide whether, in fact, we sit back and enjoy it and do everything we can to prevent further proliferation in the area, or whether, in fact, we adopt other tactics stronger sanctions or military force. Um, the, uh, remind me of the second question. It is about whether we, option, all options are on the table. Okay, good or bad. I mean, I think that no president in an election year, has been in an election year since 2009, <laughs> <laughs> obviously we have, wants to be in a position of saying he's preemptively capitulating to the Iran. And that's the problem. Yeah, <laughs> sure. So, 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 pure, pure politics. 
there, there's no. Well, there's a lot of politics, and there's a lot of politics in democracy, a lot of politics in elections. But I think there are political concerns at the moment which seem to outweigh what I would call interest concerns. I guess is the end of that. Kelly Rico. So that was a nice entree to my question that has to do with domestic politics. Um, unless I misheard you, I, I think you said that the NIMBY problem might be easier to solve by attempting burden sharing. And on the face of it, it seems to me that actually that proliferates both the political and security problems associated with their own spent fuel. So I'd like to hear you say yeah. a bit more about well, how you I mean, uh, see I this think, solving the problem. I mean, if you solve the NIMBY problem in the countries that have already too much plutonium and don't know what to do with it, that's better than solving the countries that don't have plutonium but like to have it make weapons out of it. So I was not proposing that in a sense we proliferate spent fuel storage to all kinds of places that would potentially misuse it. I'm not interested in that. No, but even, even domestically, since I'm, I guess I'm spending a lot of time thinking well, about Well, we already have it pretty proliferated. There are 120 reactors in the United States with storage pools where we have fuel. So even if we had only 10 sites, we would have a, a, a huge improvement in the security. If you think people can walk in and pick it up and take it out, I don't think they can. But, you know, but I think the notion of having it in a stronger facility, uh, more concentrated, uh, does provide an additional security in, in remote areas and maybe headed for underground. Okay, I guess I was just yeah. curious as to how, mm -hmm. as to how you were going to sell it to the, to the folks uh, locally since we've had significant problems selling yeah. it to the single site. I mean, uh, Yaku Nam's a perfect example. Mm -hmm. I think we have to wait for Harry Bird to go, Harry Reid to go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, I mean, in the end, if you have a perfect facility, uh, you have to be able to bring the public in the state along with it, uh, and that requires a lot of extra work. And of course, the Yaku Mountain example has now put everybody on notice that they will be accepting something that no right-minded Nevada would ever vote for. In the end, I don't think that there's huge crowds in Nevada lining up to demonstrate against the other mountain, but uh, ha ha Harry Reid tended to think it had something to do with his future election, so it was not a way for him to go. But I think that in the end, we have to, we have to look at that. If we've got all this stuff, it's not going to go away. Um, and I think a better and more secure way of dealing with it uh, is in the national interest, and I think we have a better job explaining to people in Nevada how it is going to radiate their kids. Daniel Altman, do you still in yeah. here? Yeah. Um, so you mentioned the problem with double standards, and obviously there are yeah. a lot of them. There's one hardwired into the NPC itself. Uh, there's others that give you for a deal of who's getting rich by our standards. Who yeah. can't be the... My question is, is, do these double standards really matter? And uh, assuming you think they do, how can you convince those of us who, who might be tempted to believe, well, ultimately it just comes down to a real calculation about how the power and interests of the actors involved, and this stuff is just rhetoric and doesn't actually well, um, you might find people who have no respect for the opinions of others, and that's possible. On the other hand, there are consequences, and the more, in fact, that you can create a common standard that is widely supported, the more you can support consequences if it isn't observed. And I think that part of the argument has some validity. Uh, and my own view is that it is not the magic bullet that will make all of this happen. Uh, and some people will stand out against it. On the other hand, um, it's a lot easier to move it if you say everybody who's now doing it will, will, will be following the same standard, in part because a lot of what they're doing is justified by the fact that it's permitted in the NPT, and it's what everybody else is doing. But not a conclusive answer in, in terms of that all you have to do is accept this and everything will go away. Of course not. It's just a reinforcement, put it this way, of our ability to act on the other hand. Phil, did you have your hand up earlier? I didn't, but I can always ask you a question. <laughs> <laughs> well, there was a forest of hands over there. Well, I, well, I, I did have a, a question specific. Can you be a little bit more specific about the type of sanctions that you believe the U.S. could actually impose for this? Well, I think the type of sanctions that, in my view, would have an outside chance of being effective in Iran would be the kind of sanctions that would raise the price of fuel to $200 a pound. Here. Yeah, well, 
Everywhere. $200 a barrel is everywhere. Everywhere, everywhere. Yeah. Everywhere. yeah. yeah. We don't have differential prices. Right. 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 Except for quality in the oil industry. So I think we're talking about that. Uh, and maybe there is a way to escape that. Uh, maybe uh, over a period of time we'll use less fossil fuel. Uh, but that's sort of where I think we are now. Those figures may be exaggerated, but I think there, we would expect if Iran, if Iran petroleum exports were off the world market. Uh, and we could pretty well do that except for pipelines, just in the lab. Uh, would we be prepared to go ahead and do that? And would that have some effect? I think it would have a significant effect in Iran. But I also used to worry because, as you know, I was in the United Nations at the time we did the sanctions against Saddam Hussein. Uh, in the end, I had my last chicken sandwich symbol. The last chicken sandwich in Iraq belongs to Saddam Hussein. He makes all the decisions. So, in effect, uh, sanctions are hurting a lot of people, but are they hurting the guy who makes the decisions enough to make that happen? And would the eye fall a little bit? And would that make change? I don't know. But the problem is that those types of sanctions appear to be off the table yeah. since the 90s. And so, what types of sanctions other than just symbolic type? Well, I mean, we've done some things. I think that the financial sanctions have hurt, but not to change fundamental. Iranian energy, particularly when we're challenging. I think there's another piece that you have to look at here, and that's Iranian views of the United States. But whether we like it or not, I think there is huge motivation in the regime to do everything they can to block the U.S. because they believe the U.S. objective is regime change. And keeping everything on the table is a sort of way of reinforcing that unless we take it off the table. And at the moment, we're not prepared to take it off. Uh, I don't think we do well at regime change. It's not something that we have learned uh, that uh, we can make happen very effectively. And I think it's a mistake to try, but they don't believe that necessarily. Uh, and they may be reading all kinds of things as being part of a regime change scenario, including sabotage of their nuclear program, which they insist is purely for civilian purposes. Gene Dillon? I wanted to ask a question uh, more generally on the uh, proliferation. Uh, do you see any role of the business and any of the, the idea, for example, recently the voluntary uh, adherence to export controls on technology for nuclear uh, evil facilities, uh, which could be dual use? I'm just, I'm just, no, I think, I'm just I'm not thinking, you know what I'm thinking, is there another Iran out there, or is there another North Korea out there? Are we looking at any kind of proliferation? Well, I think it's up to governments to tell industry what they wish to see them restrict with regard to government objectives. It's not up to industry to take the whip between their teeth and run ahead of governments on these kinds of things, in part because you know and I know that any industry that did would be up and out of the market. So we have to find a way to keep the marketplace level. Now, there are inequities around the world, and there are people who cheat on sanctions, and those cause special problems. Uh, and maybe in the end, those who feel that sanctions will be forever ineffective are right that you can never get a significant amount of enforcement to make them effective. And then there are people like me who believe even some of the sanctions in the term of our discussion with the gentleman over here are not going to be sufficient to do the job anyway. And those that are sufficient to do the job may cause us such terrible problems we're not yet ready to take them on. I was thinking really actually of science and technology ex, you know, transfer. I was thinking of, can you really keep a lid on this? Or is it, I, I deal with biological weapons issues, as you know, and, and that's a big issue because you can't keep a, you can't keep a lid on microbiology, it's actually international. So I guess I'm, I'm looking for, you know, what, I think, what's the I think, you know, in, in a way, Maybe some elements of technology we can keep tight. For a long time, we had some success in controlling marriaging steel. And one of the reasons why I think the Iranians have made their centrifuge out of carbon is that they couldn't get marriaging steel. Um, I don't know that you could ever do it. I think it's also true that in the end, knowledge is not subject to tight controls. Uh, and discovery is not subject to controls, particularly outside of the area of influence over the discoverers. And so in the end, I don't think you can depend upon lockup uh, 
particularly in things like uh, business competition, uh, to be an absolute certain uh, uh, support for whatever business advantages you have. What you can depend upon is large amounts of investment in R&D to continue to keep you ahead of the way, if I can put it that way, in whatever area you're involved in. And different industries in different parts of the world have different turnover times than this. Uh, but I think that's the, the way in which most companies who look at the question of s and competition uh, look at where their, where their uh, ability to maintain a leading edge comes from. I have two people left on the list, Dean Knox and Chris Clary. Yeah, but I, I could also say that, you know, <laughs> in, the perfect example is protection and trade. You protect industries and trade, and you create artifacts that are no longer competitive in the external market. Uh, because, in fact, they get lazy, they enjoy the domestic market, that's all they're interested in, and in the end, you pay much higher prices. My own view, too, is that in the end, it's through competition you develop viable new jobs, not through the protection of people in declining industry. I mean, you may do some protection in declining industry to cycle people out into different things. But I, those are the theories of free trade. My own view is they pretty well work. I think this administration has its doubts. I think partly its doubts are once again motivated by election year concerns and the fact that the, the trade union movement in the United States is in a serious state of decline and is fighting for its life, uh, and it's connected, obviously, with the future of the administration and how that goes, and those are all parts of our political life. But I think that if you end up with a situation in which you depend for the long run on your national pro prosperity and creating something which is going to be 20 years out of date very rapidly, then you'll pay a price for it. Dean? Uh, you seem to rule out pretty quickly uh, any sort of technological barriers to plutonium use but at the same time, you accept that they may be useful in uranium, for example, by fabricating and building in fuel. Uh, I just wonder, you know, what, why not, uh, react, why not blending with reactor trade You know, you say that we were able to make reactor trade with the bomb, but that was after a massive testing program. Uh, I mean, I have a hard time believing that that Iran could deploy a reactor trade with any weapon well, with any sort of confidence. There. And, and yeah. what about other technologies? I mean, what about other technologies? There is a pure. I mean, what, what's the role of that? I mean, I don't know enough about it. My sense is that uh, something that, in effect, popularizes uh, the development of processes, the end result of which can be material that pretty much is ready to use, uh, is not a good price. The, 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 the test that, that we did on reactor energy yeah. was by people that were physically isolated from the legacy of testing. So yeah. they made So they went from right. zero up. Yeah. Right. Oh, that's very helpful for help. I, I didn't know that, but I assumed that you know they knew something about <laughs> so it. Okay. Chris Clary, you're gonna get the last question. Uh, I guess I wanted to <clears throat> express some skepticism about the utility of having some sort of automaticity to sanctions in the event of uh, the next next guy yeah. coming on the block. Particularly because I don't think it's going to get easier, right? Iran and Syria might be easy compared to, well, I don't know what the next dominoes would be. Do they presumably be Egypt or Saudi or Iraq Turkey. or unified Korea or Japan or Turkey? I mean, I don't think you can plausibly imagine the P5, if, even if they said they would automatically sanction, they wouldn't actually automatically sanction the event of these important federal states going. So, okay, I'm fine with that as like a, basically a charade so that Iran is automatically sanctioned. But yeah, I, reality, think that, I think that you're right that it it's not the dispositive block. I think more important is to begin to do a reinforcement of our own relationships, including nuclear commitment. And I think using, in effect, the approach that we used with NATO. Not that we would give them bombs to drop with their own aircraft, but we would get close to that. And we're struggling with that problem.
I want to thank you all for coming this evening and for your attention. Um, and and uh, 